Okay, welcome everyone. So this is day three of Psychological Professions Week 2022, which is and it's our third third year of doing this. So today we're going to learn a little bit more about the Psychological Professions Network. And um, so the title today is What Can the PPN Do for Me and What Can I Do for the PPN? So hopefully by the end of today you'll have a much better idea of how you can contribute and also what you can get out of being a member of the PPN. So just a little bit about housekeeping. <clears throat> You should see in your screen the slider window, so please post your questions. We're going to not do questions um, through the beginning, but we'll have a slot at the end for a bit of a Q&A. There's some um, information around any technical issues or an email, and we are being recorded. So if you don't want your name to appear, please um, post anonymously in Slido. And again, at the end of the session, you should see a link at the bottom for your attendance certificate, which you can download. And we'd certainly like you to complete just a few feedback questions, which will appear towards the end as well. So um, hope you enjoy it and onwards. So where did the psychological professions all begin? So around about 10 years ago, we did a bit of work in the northwest of England in terms of bringing together all the psychological practitioners. So this was clinical psychologists, cognitive behavior therapists, counselors, psychological well-being practitioners, psychological therapists, and others. And we included service providers, education and training reps, and professional bodies. And I think part of the rationale for doing that was a way of we're all quite small groups individually, but collectively we can have a much stronger voice. And it's taken until now for us to have a chief national officer or, or a clinical lead for the psychological professions. And Adrian just started at the beginning of October. I think the other thing to remember about the PPN is it's a multi-professional network. And the aim was very much then to promote parity of esteem between physical health and mental health. And I think one of the things that's really important is to think about what's important to all of us. Now, these I think will probably, if you have an interest in psychological well-being or interest in health, they're probably important to you too. But these were the things we agreed as being probably one of the, the underpinning principles of the Psychological Professions Network, which was promoting mental health and psychological well-being, delivering safe and effective services, looking at education and training, commissioning workforce planning, and sharing knowledge and expertise across healthcare. And I think cre creating opportunities to share, learn, and innovate. And what we'll hear a bit more of today is what people have done in their roles in the PPN, and also how the PPNs help them, and how they've helped the PPN. So after all that, what is it? Um, not going to labour this because you'll probably have seen this in, in other slides. It's the NHS professional leadership at regional level for the three main psychological professions groups. So that's psychologists, psychological therapists and psychological practitioners. And we're funded by Health Education England. And as I said, it's a network that connects all the major stakeholders in the psychological professions. What it isn't is a profession. It is not a professional body. There are professional bodies like the British Psychological Society, like the British Association for um, Psychotherapy and Counselling, like the, um, let me think, the Association for Child Psychotherapy. S professional bodies are really, really important and they support their members, they help them with CPD, they help them with standards and quality. The PPN isn't there to do that and isn't there to replicate that. Neither is it a trade union. We don't lobby on, the, on pay or anything conditions. There are trade unions to do that. And I think the other thing that's important is it's not a body led entirely by the agenda and interests of its mem members. There's an overlap between what we do and what the arms length bodies also do. And it's how we work together to support those aims, but also have the space to innovate, to, to create change and improvement in psychological services. And it isn't purely about mental health. As Many of you will know watching this today that psychological professions work across all of healthcare, not just in mental health. And later on on Friday, you'll hear a little bit more about some of the work that's been going on in the physical health settings. So our vision, we focus very much on inform, enable and influence. So how do we actually let people know about the psychological professions? How do we support our members to do that and engage in promoting psychological services? And how do we influence policy and practice and organisation at all levels to ensure that psychological approaches are embedded within health and social care for all? So what can we achieve regionally? I think regional 
the PPNs have a joined up approach, international policy making, workforce planning. We can work collectively to, with regional partners and the changing systems to actually grow that voice. And we're a community of practice. And I think one of the things that's important to think about is that there are over 13,000 members of the PPNs across England. And some there's around 4,000 of those in the Northwest, for example. So having that community of practice, having that group of people just strengthens our voice for the benefit of promoting psychological work. So just a little bit of history. This is where we started in the Northwest. You'll hear from Liz a little bit later. Um, and then the southeast joined us and then the southwest and you'll hear from sam a little bit later and midlands northeast and yorkshire london and east of england we started all those in the pandemic and i think it's it's all credit to the chairs and other team the rest of the team in those areas that we've actually managed to make those networks start and work and you probably have heard a little bit more from some of our colleagues in those areas this week so Without any further ado, that's just a little bit of an introduction. I'm now going to hand over to Liz. So Liz is a principal lecturer at University of Central Lancashire, and she's also the co-chair of Northwest Psychological Professions Network with me. And Liz has been around from the very beginning, um, and her contribution to the PPN has been massive, but I'll let her tell you all about that. So now over to Liz. Thank you, Geeta. Um, yes, yeah, so as Geeta said, uh, my name is Liz Kell. I'm a principal lecturer in the northwest of England at the University of Central Lancashire, where I'm course leader for the PWP training. And I've been co chair of the Northwest PPN with Geeta for 12 months. So I'm going to talk a bit about my experience of being involved with the PPN, which is almost a 10 year experience, although I promise I'm going to keep it briefer than that. I took the title quite literally. This is about what the PPN has done for the PWP workforce, which was the original route that I got involved through in the network. But it's also a little bit about me, both what the PPN has done for me personally and what I have done for the PPN. I'm going to give you a bit of a brief history of what's happened, what the impacts of that have been and how and where we are now and what we've learned from that and where we're going. So I thought using a model of reflection was quite appropriate for that. In some ways, I'm a little bit of an anomaly because I started as a primary care graduate mental health worker in 2004 in the northwest of England. And a lot of the learning from that role fed into the development of the now well established psychological wellbeing practitioner role. As I've said, I'm now course leader for the PWP training at one of the northwest universities. And my last NHS role before moving to the university was to set up and manage a standalone PWP service. Since 2004, there have been a number of different different networks that I've been involved in, but prior to the PPN launching, these were often less formal or structured, and at times became more about a small number of people, including myself and Claire Bagley, who's the programme manager of the PPN in the Northwest, finding opportunities to pull groups together. So this included using a Northwest IAPT forum for a few years, and that was really useful, but it was very much about the setup and launch and development of IAPT rather than it being a permanent network. In 2005, I was editor for a graduate worker newsletter for about two years, I think, and the National Institute for Mental Health of England supported that. And then with huge support from Claire, I really helped with the coordination of a number of PWP masterclasses from 2009 to 2012, which was really the start of an informal PWP community of network, a community of practice. These were broadly supported by HEE and the IAPT forum, but involved a lot of searching for opportunities to link things into rather than there being any formal structured support. And that meant the work was often piecemeal and it became incredibly difficult to build momentum. So in 2013, when the Northwest PPN launched, there was suddenly a very different opportunity because I'd been around and supporting those different work streams for a number of years and Claire was involved in the PPN, I was lucky in some ways to be in the right place at the right time. The launch of the PPN was very clearly described as a home for all psychological professions. So the PWP community of practice development also gave an opportunity to really showcase and demonstrate this commitment. The PPN approached this through supporting a kickstart event and they did this for a number of different work streams, that, but the PWP was one of the first and has achieved a huge amount with the continued support of the PPN. 
So what did this mean for the PWP workforce in the northwest of England? Well, importantly, it gave us a home. There has been such a rapid growth of the PWP workforce over this period of time and in such a fast paced role, it was really easy to remain head down in your day job in your own service. And the PPN, through the creation of the community of practice, gave us somewhere to come together, to share best practice, to share our challenges and recognise that we weren't the only ones having these experiences and to really help us to develop a professional voice and raise awareness of our role. As part of the community of practice, we also developed a senior PWP network, which as an even newer role than the PWP role, often only having one in each service at the time, proved a really invaluable network. Through this group, we took on really important pieces of work. We reviewed the person specs for PWP roles to try and help support the widening participation and improve the diversity of the workforce. We created the first PWP code of conduct, which a number of trusts chose to adopt in the North and also other regions. And we had the opportunity to write a published discussion paper on the importance of PWP accreditation and registration. Through the creation of the community of practice, this also gave the network, and me specifically at the time, a place at the table representing PWPs as part of the workforce board, alongside other psychological professions. This allowed me to advocate for the role, to help others see opportunities and challenges in how different policies and developments may impact on this workforce group particularly, but also to allow other professions to better understand the role. Although this was very much a Northwest development, we also began to link with other regions. I had lots of conversations with a couple of senior PWPs in the northeast of England who were also running a similar network, although there wasn't a PWP, a PPN network at the time for it to sit with. And I supported the setup of a senior PWP network in the Yorkshire and Humber region. For a few years, we ran a PWP North conference, which, while very much a collaboration, would not we would not have been able to do without the amazing support of the Northwest PPN. So now what? As I've described, a huge amount of work has happened since the PPN commenced, and I'm not sure this would have been possible without the PPN. There is now a low intensity SIG within the BABCP. And the recent launch of the Psychological Practitioner Register by both the BABCP and BPS further supports the coming of age of this workforce with the support of other organisations. But the PPN will continue to be an important home for us. For the community of practice, there's a timely refresh underway. An interim chair has been identified and we have a launch event in December. And the intention is for this to become a network for all the new psychological practitioner roles, which is a really exciting opportunity. We want to build on our success, but support the wider workforce as it continues to grow and develop. And I'm really excited to see what this work will become moving forward. So I said at the start that this was a little bit about me as well. As you've heard from my story, I've been around for a long time now. I've been part of the PPN since it commenced in 2013 and became part of the workforce board in 2015. From October 21, I became the co-chair of the Northwest PPM with Gita, and this feels like such a privileged role to undertake. I'm very proud to be the first PPM co-chair who isn't a clinical psychologist and to be able to continue to support the important work the network does. And I take my responsibility of championing the new roles and ensuring they're not forgotten very seriously. I also like to think I am one example of the possibilities that the PPN can provide psychological professionals. This is a truly multi-professional network and the value of all psychological professions being represented is really important to both our history and our future. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. And I think, I think that's been a lovely illustration of both what you've done for the PPN and what you benefited from from the PPN but it I mean how you separate the two I think is really quite tricky because um, it's two-way traffic and I think that's what's really really illustrated I think the, the benefits of the community of practice approach within the PPN so as we move on um, I'm delighted to introduce Sam Strickland so Sam's a graduate research assistant at the psychological professions in the southwest and she'll be um, just sharing with us a project that's been undertaken in the southwest which is an example of the way that PPN can support the system but also engage with a wide set of 
of um, stakeholders and psychological professionals to actually contribute to how do we take and solve some of the challenges we've got within our workforce. So without any further ado, it's over to you, Sam. Thanks, Geeta. So hi, everyone. Um, as Geeta said, I'm Sam Strickland um, and I'm a graduate research assistant at the Psychological Professions Network Southwest. Um, and I'm going to be giving you a bit of a flavour of the sort of work that we do um, by talking about our rapid review of supervision for psychological therapies for severe mental health problems or PTSMHP. Um, so this was an NHS funded uh, piece of work that the Southwest PPN did in the spring of this year, um, where we scoped current requirements and capacity for supervision, um, as well as barriers and enablers uh, to providing sufficient psychological supervision for the identified modalities and roles um, and identified some recommendations for how to improve this as well. So we'll give you a quick overview of what we set out to do. Um, so we wanted to understand the needs for supervisory capacity um, to support the development of a psychologically informed workforce um, to deliver the aspirations described in the NHS long term plan. Uh, we also wanted to explore the impact of the developments described in the community mental health framework um, and the psychological supervision needs um, that result from this changing landscape. And we wanted to use all of this to produce something that will be useful in addressing these needs uh, to help identify a strategic plan with each chief psychological professions officer in each integrated care system um, across the southwest uh, to help move towards a consistent approach to the delivery of psychological therapies. So these were the um, therapeutic modalities and roles that we looked at. Um, which are the health education funded therapies, roles and trainings um, that are used for severe mental health problems in the Southwest. Uh, so these include um, psychological therapies on the right there. Uh, so that's cognitive behavioural therapy for psychosis and bipolar disorder, uh, CBT for personality disorder and for eating disorders as well, dialectical behaviour therapy, mentalisation based treatments, family interventions for psychosis and bipolar disorder, structured clinical management, and the Maudsley model of anorexia therapy for adults as well. Um, there are also newer therapies like eye movement desensitization and reprocessing and cognitive analytic therapy, and then a couple of new roles that we have in the Southwest as well. And these were clinical associates in psychology and mental health and wellbeing practitioners. Uh, so here's what we did. Um, the first thing we did uh, was to produce an at a glance table on what services need to provide supervision wise for each modality and role during and after training um, by mapping out the uh, curricula and accreditation standards for each modality and role. Uh, we also conducted a survey um, to identify current potential supervision capacity um, as well as gaps in provision and enablers to and barriers to that provision as well. Um, and we also held a focus group. Uh, so this was a meeting convened with all the available um, PTSMHP leads in our region uh, to better understand the need for psychological supervision uh, for the wider mental health workforce. Um, so we discussed um, the requests made to them for supervision for both these structured psychological interventions and broader psychologically informed practice as well, um, as well as where these requests have come from, so inside or outside of their trusts and what meeting them would entail. Uh, so here's a little snapshot of the supervision requirements table. Um, it's too long to fit on a single slide, uh, but these first two entries give you an idea of the sort of information it includes. Um, it has a lot of information that until now hasn't been available in one place, um, and some of which wasn't available online, um, as we had to contact course leads directly for some of it. Um, so that's made it a really useful resource for anyone who wants to understand what the requirements are uh, for supervising these therapies and roles. Um, and here is some of the things that we learned from the survey. Um, so one of the really early pieces of learning from this um, was that it's really difficult to get all of this information and it's held in many different places. So in some trusts, one person was able to source all the information that we were asking for. And in others, we received responses from numerous different service leads from across the trust. 
Um, in some places, there were even conflicting responses, um, which really highlighted just how complex the situation around supervision is. Um, we also had um, varying response rates, um, especially in larger, more complex and fragmented trusts. Um, so what we ended up wasn't a complete picture of supervision in the Southwest because there was some um, information missing. Um, and uh, one of the main things we found out is that there are many different ways that supervision is done across the region. Uh, so some services use group supervision, some only use one-on-one, -on -one, some make use of peer supervision, um, some uh, pay for external supervisors, um, and as well, not all of them offer the same uh, therapeutic modalities and roles. Uh, so there's quite a lot of difference. Um, and some of them as well have a clear amount of time allocated for supervision and others don't. Uh, so the table on the right shows some of this variation. Um, so this is the number of supervisees for each supervisor. Um, and the largest difference between services is seen in family interventions for psychosis, where one service had 30 supervisees for one supervisor and some had two supervisors for every supervisee. Uh, so you can see that across the region, there are huge differences in what supervision actually looks like. Um, so in the survey, we also asked some qualitative questions um, about what would enable staff who are already supervising to take on more hours of supervision or supervisees, um, and about why staff that can supervise but aren't, aren't providing supervision at the moment, and what would enable them to do so. Um, and as well, what would enable staff who are not yet technically qualified to do so to supervise. Um, so common themes that came up include capacity. Uh, so this was mentioned across every trust. Uh, staff who are already supervising are offering as much supervision as they currently can and are unable to offer more without backfills um, for the other responsibilities in their roles that would then release their time uh, for supervision. Um, supervision being a recognised part of someone's role um, also came up. Uh, so the inclusion of supervision responsibilities in roles with then protected time in their job plan um, was seen as something that was really important to facilitating supervision. Um, but it was acknowledged that for some this might require a change in staff members banding um, and that this would lead to increased costs in the trust. Um, and as well, competing demands. So um, all of the people that provide supervision have a range of different responsibilities across their role. Um, and there were only eight staff identified across the whole region who can only supervise one of these therapies or roles. Uh, so everyone here is being pulled in different directions and has a lot of competing demands on their time. So after this survey, we held a focus group um, with the available PTSMHP leads from across the region uh, to ask them about the requests that they get for supervision um, from other areas within their trust and from third sector organisations as well, um, and what it would take for them to meet these requests. Uh, so again, capacity came up. Uh, they get a lot of these requests um, and it puts a strain on their resources and it comes from um, elsewhere in their trusts, but also um, voluntary sector partners as well. Um, planning and governance was also a, current, uh, a common theme. Um, so uh, it was found that supervision was often an afterthought, and sometimes new teams were created in trusts or services, and only afterwards did they come to the PTSMHP leads um, asking for supervision. Uh, some areas uh, said that voluntary sector partners um, expected this supervision without any formal roles actually being created to provide it. Um, uh, there were also leads that had been asked to carry out additional oversight by their trust um, to review the governance practices and models of their third sector partners. Um, and this work was seen as important and adjacent to supervision. Um, and another element of the structures around it that need to function for supervision to be provided effectively. Um, understanding and expectations of supervision also came up. So the difference between clinical supervision and reflective practice was highlighted. 
um, uh, with one lead saying that some staff who are qualified in mod modality specific supervision wouldn't necessarily be able to provide the reflective practice that the third sector often ask for. Um, and in another service, there had been a lack of understanding about the type of supervision and support um, required by social prescribers, um, leading to issues in providing that supervision. Um, uh, and there was another uh, service that had um, included supervision in one of their care pathways and in the development of it at an early stage. Um, but they then found that other parts of the system were then expecting them to supervise other staff as well that were out of their scope um, and said that being explicit about what supervision these staff offer is really crucial in protecting their time so that they can actually provide that supervision. So we used all this information to create this table of barriers and enablers um, to the provision of supervision. Um, I don't have time to cover it in detail. Uh, uh, it includes things like supervision competencies and time allocation not being clearly specified in job descriptions or job plans um, as a barrier, um, but then this could be addressed uh, through the development of example job descriptions for supervisors um, and example job plans for PTSMHP therapists and supervisors. Um, and then other barriers as well, like a high general vacancy rate across services, um, but then this is also an opportunity to take advantage of these vacancies uh, to review supervision competencies um, and think about the potential for recruit to train roles as well. Uh, so this brings us to our recommendations um, for what different people and organisations in the system can do to help lift these barriers. Uh, so we said that service leads should review their current supervision arrangements um, in order to maximise the capacity of supervisors uh, using our requirements table um, and ensure that there's clear time allocation for supervision in job plans um, and also to prioritise the allocation of places on top up and briefer practitioner training courses uh, to people who are already experienced supervisors but who don't currently meet specific modality requirements. Uh, we said that workforce planners and transformation leads uh, should ensure that supervision requirements are clearly resourced um, and review vacant roles in regard to supervision expectations in job plans and consider recruit to train models for vacant roles as well. Integrated care systems um, should ensure the involvement of chief psych psychological professions officers and other psychological professionals who are able to advise on supervision and other support requirements um, in all of their workforce planning forums at organisational and system levels. Uh, regional arms length bodies uh, should consider procurement of additional external supervisor time for MBT and EMDR, um, as well as financial backfill for those undertaking supervisor training and generic supervisor competencies um, uh, and, generic supervisor, and generic supervisor training um, alongside uh, modality specific courses. Um, and that this should be mapped against core supervisor competencies as well as trauma informed and cultural competencies as well, as, uh, as, well as the um, specific modality requirements. Um, uh, they should also develop practical resources, including guidance for workforce planners on the requirements of supervision and example job descriptions and job plans as well. Um, the PPN Southwest uh, will facilitate exploring options to share supervisor capacity for EMDR, um, including regular sharing of information between organisations regarding local supervisor demand and capacity um, and support communities of practice that address these issues as well. Um, and the National Mental Health Programme should clarify the training and ongoing supervision requirements for each modality um, as part of updates to the PTSMHT implementation guidance uh, using our requirements table as a basis. So where does this work leave us and what has happened since? Um, so the recommendation to have senior psychological professionals um, involved in the room um, has been included in recent NHS England and Health Education England facilitated workforce planning workshops um, that are being delivered in every integrated care system across the Southwest. Uh, there have also been other workshops for mental health service providers in the Southwest um, that have included several of the recommendations for workforce planners and service transformation leads as well. Um, and the Southwest is not the only place where this type of work is going on. Um, the Northeast has developed a supervision hub uh, for staff that are involved in improving access to psychological therapies roles. Um, and London uh, is sharing supervision resources as well. 
Um, we've been doing some similar things in the Southwest. So there's currently a proposal being developed uh, for a Southwest supervision hub now um, with um, regional procurement of additional external supervisor capacity also being considered. Um, and the PPN Southwest is also working with um, uh, Health Education England and NHS England regionally uh, to support our system to share information and supervision capacity. Um, and this is being planned into our work plan for 2023 uh, so that we can continue to support the system in our region in providing supervision for these therapies and roles so that they can then provide the best possible care to the people who use their services. Thank you very much for listening. Um, I'll be around to answer any questions in the Q&A section later on in the session. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. That I think that's, that was a really, really great example of how the PPN can actually support local services and local systems to try and identify some of the challenges and then come up with some shared solutions that, you know, we can cooperate across our organisational boundaries. And also, I think it reflects perhaps some of the strength that we can actually work across different regions um, to create the solutions and develop the solutions to some of our challenges. So, yes, I know there's some questions coming in. Keep them coming in and we'll have an opportunity to ask Sam and Liz and our other speakers because some of those questions at the end. So what I'd like to do is move on um, and introduce Joe. So Joe's, we have an expert by experience um, group in the Northwest, and this is something that's certainly been developing a lot in the other regions. And this is a relatively short slot because I know we've had we've had much longer sessions, I think yesterday around the experts by experience, but I really wanted to make sure that um, we shared the input of experts by experience and the difference that they can make to the work of the psychological professions but also how perhaps we can support experts by experience in terms of how they develop and contribute to our work so this little section of video um, is part of a wider webinar which the experts by experience group in the northwest ppn created and we can share some links to those um, later but you can check them out on the website but i just wanted to share joe's um, comments because i think well, I hope you agree that they I think they sum up quite well what what this partnership approach can actually bring. And Joe will be around at the end to answer any questions or share his thoughts as well. So I think without any further ado, let's go to the video. I'm going to hand over to Joe now. He's going to talk a little bit about the benefits of involvement. Um, this is something that we want to champion. We want to help people have an awareness of what the benefits are, both in terms of in terms of um, our own personal benefits, but also what we've seen and what we've learned from others as well. So I'm going to hand over to Joe now. Um, thanks, Jody, and um, uh, thanks again, everybody. Um, so I've been engaged in PPI work since 2012. And in that 10 years, I feel I have developed personally and professionally. Before retirement, I didn't always feel I was listened to. I feel I am now and my personal experience counts for something. Engagement has increased incrementally like a droplet in a pool. First Manchester, then the Northwest, and then nationally. Being an expert by experience and being paid appropriately as one is self-affirming and self-empowering, building confidence, breaking down barriers between us and them, service users and clinicians. Confidence begets confidence. A virtuous circle of good vibe ripples is set in motion and expands. Intersectionality has meaning. I can be a service user and a carer simultaneously, and a strong sense of partnership with clinicians of being on the journey together takes shape. Much more confident than I was when I set out in 2012, I feel as an EBE I am being heard and I am part of an urgent ongoing conversation during this transformational time when disruptive technologies and overwhelming demand are challenging the way we do things. The goal is simple, to help clinicians work wisely and well. Thank you. Thanks, 
Joe, and we'll hear from you live later. But I think that was just a lovely illustration. And I think so far this morning, we've heard from our members and experts by experience. So without further ado, I think this is this is a contribution in terms of how does the PPN influence systems and support systems in terms of taking the world of psychological professions forward. So I'm delighted to introduce Mike Burgess. Um, so Mike is now the NHS um, England and Health Education England Northwest Head of Workforce Transformation. And he's going to share with us the contribution of the PPN to workforce planning. So over to you, Mike. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, as Geeta said, I'm uh, Mike Burgess. Um, I'm currently the head of, of Workforce Transformation. Um, some of you may re remember me from prior to 2017 when I was the um, head of Workforce Strategy and Planning in HE in the Northwest. And um, we did do a number of sessions with the, the PPN network on on workforce planning and, and the contribution to the, the Northwest Workforce Strategy. Oh. Yeah, they're not, it's not working. <laughs> oh, right, thank you. Um, so the, 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 I'm, I'm really pleased to, to have listened to the, the previous presentations and um, workforce planning has been mentioned a couple of times around how the PPN can contribute, but actually the importance of workforce planning, not just around, around supervision, but also at this, this critical time in, in the health and, and care service um, world. We know we've got the autumn statement tomorrow by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, um, Jeremy Hunt, um, the 17th. Again, and I think that's going to be pivotal around, around how, how we're going to plan going, going forward. So what am I going to talk to you about this morning? I, I think the importance and the contribution of the PPN to workforce planning, sort of a, a definition and context of what it is in this this new integrated world, as we, as we know, the integrated care boards and the integrated care systems became statutory organisations from the 1st of July, which sort of changes the playing field of how we plan across regions, how we plan across systems, how we plan across places and down to neighbourhoods and, and providers. I'm going to touch on big data and sort of the population health approach and that workforce intelligence of, of why we need to plan with this network and why this, this network needs a voice in that planning. And then some of the roles and responsibilities uh, within the roadmap. Throughout the presentation, I'm gonna just touch on an overview of workforce planning and the parts to play. I'm sure you'll get a copy of the slides um, at the, the end of the presentation. So this is, it's, it, it's a step through, but it's also a bit of a resource pack for you if, this, if workforce planning is an interest to you. So it looks at some of the process steps understanding your workforce supply your current and future some some around talent management and succession planning training needs analysis um role redesign and workforce transformation and you're probably thinking oh my goodness there's a there's a lot there in that list to get through in in 15 minutes next slide please so the importance and the contribution um, there is a current reality to, to the world we live in at the moment and the demand for health and psychological well-being intervention um, is, is rapidly increasing on a, on a daily basis. Um, I've just been reading an article in the, in the news this morning about the demand for, for children's mental health as well as adult mental health and psychological intervention and how that has increased um, rapidly over the last few months. We've had the impact of COVID-19, long COVID-19, and, and other associated psychological impacts um, with that. We've got a cost of living crisis and the psychological impact of not just um, patients and populations and carers for them, but actually on the workforce as well. So we need to remember the importance of the workforce in, in these plans. Um, we've got over 7 million people on elective waiting lists. Some have been waiting almost two years. Again, the psychological impact of that. Um, I've mentioned the, the um, autumn statement tomorrow, but impacts from the pestle environment and, and life pressures. 
um, really, really forged the need and the demand for, 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 for mental health and psychological intervention. We still got the demands from the mental health long term plan and long term plan that we've not filled yet. Um, the health and well being of the population and the workforce caring for the population, we need to really look after them. We have got a, an aging workforce in some areas and, and we do have generational approaches. In, in some of our provider trusts, we've got five different generations. We've all got different views and how they psychologically behave in, in interactions. And we need to ensure that you've got a voice um, as an individual in, in your service, in your organization, within your, your neighborhood, within place, system and region and input into that national planning process. And it was great to hear what, what they're doing in London, in the, the Southeast, the Southwest. And um, we can arrange uh, workforce planning webinars um, to support this, this network. Um, we can record them and they can be used as a training aid. So next slide, please. So in, in terms of the, the the, the, the importance, we need to look and consider the breadth of the workforce. So we know that there are over 20,000 psychological professions working in NHS commission services in England and probably over about 3,500 in, 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 the, in the Northwest. And that, that's based on a, a, a proxy percentage of the size of the Northwest. But actually, it really gives us a clue that we need to really understand the baselines of, of what we've got, where they are, what and what they're doing we know it covers a whole range of different roles from clinical psychologists right through that list of of 12 i'm not going to go through each one line by line and we've also got new roles that are that are coming online around the mental health and well-being practitioners the youth intensive psychological practitioners um yet for short and the associate psychological um practitioner as well which um, is a is a northwest flagship um, trailblazing program and in that planning we need to think around recruitment retention development supervision engagement health and well-being succession planning talent leadership everything you're probably doing on a on a on a, a daily basis so next slide please so the the integrated uh, approach um as i've said um from the first of july um integrated care boards formed and they, they, they've got an overarching view of their integrated care systems um, which are made up of integrated care places and in an integrated care place you generally have provider trusts um, primary care and community services mental health services um, down down to down to neighborhoods and the, the way that we do planning now is is fundamentally changing um, and the relationships with the ICB boards and systems is changing from a NHS England perspective and a HE perspective. And there's more subsidiarity around, around the planning with the systems and the providers in the system. And that's why it's essential that this network has that strong voice in that planning process. And it needs to mutually reinforce the reforms set out in the measures to make integrated health and care a universal reality for everyone across England, that career progression across that, that family um, supports the skills agenda in local economies, and that the ICS supports joint health and care workforce planning at place, working with both national and local organisations and networks. Next slide, please. So where do we start? Do you know... Uh, um, I've been involved with workforce planning since 2002 and it, and it still does really excite me. Um, but actually, it should be a dynamic assessment of the workforce skill mix supply and demand and the underlying risks of imbalances to enable a timely response to changes in care and to ensure high quality care, safety and value for investment in workforce development, education and, and training. Um, there's so many definitions, there's millions of definitions, but actually I really like this one because it is dynamic. You're doing it every day. You're planning your workforce, who you've got in that day to deliver the service. And then you can expand that to a week and expand it to the month, the year, and then up to, 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 to five years. But actually there are some process methodologies that allow us to define, understand and develop these actions. 
we do need to understand workforce supply and that additionality and, and retention and changes that that brings. We do need to understand the ambitions for the future in terms of team, role redesign and possibly workforce transformation. And we talk around workforce transformation where where we, in terms of supply, we really struggle around our current and future supply. We've considered all the elements of upskilling to get people to top of license, to work different, differently, to extend, enhance, or even advance their skills. But actually, if that's not sufficient, we do then need to look at workforce transformation and then hence some of these new roles have, have come on, on stream. And we do need to think about the conditions for success around how we use the investment that we do get, how we're flexible and agile in the way we work and deploy and look after people, and how we collaborate and are transparent um, around planning for the, the Psychological Professions Network. So next slide, please. And the one thing that I really want to stress, and I stress all the time in every presentation that I, that I give, it's around people. And it's all about people and people are different. People have ideas, people behave in different ways. Um, there's different behavior models, you know, there's cultural aspects to this, there's generational aspects. But at the end of the day, we're all people and we need to care for the people who are in the workforce, who are caring for the patients and people that are coming in into that, that service. And hence we have the, the people plan. And, and all that health and well-being, that engagement, that resilience, that that support is, is essential. Because if we don't do that, then people will leave and, and we will just be in a constant cycle of trying to, to recruit. So next steps, next slide, please. Sorry. So how do we plan? Um, do you know, we've, we've, we've talked around the, the new integrated approach. You will have heard it's system first, system by default. And other words you might have heard of all levels and all levers, which is sort of the, some of the new mantra around around planning. But, but actually, how do we plan? We, we need to consider time horizons, don't we? Um, to, to train somebody could be 12 months, two to four years, you know, five years and longer than that if you're looking at, at consultants. We need to consider the service needs across sectors. And this is where the integrated planning really comes into play around acute community, primary, social, and, and the private and independent and voluntary organization sectors. And, and it was great to hear uh, around you know, the experienced users who can have a real input into, into this planning. We need to plan across the professions and all staff groups. We need to organize at place network and systems. We need to use data and modeling scenarios. We need to use it in the context of the population we serve and the service delivery in a, in a learning environment dynamic. So you know, it, there's no one true answer. There's a framework to, to follow and we all have a part to, to play in that. Next slide, please. So roles and responsibilities. Um, and you may be sat there thinking, well, what's my role? What's my responsibility in this? Well, there's different levels of, of roles and responsibilities. So we need to look at the local communities and the commissioners. So the commissioners of service and that and how they how they plan what they're going to spend money on and the type of services that they want to deliver um, and have that public and patient involvement, that population focused approach and the desired outcomes of the service that they want to commission and put in place. Linked to that, we need the subject matter experts. And this is where you come in as well. Those professional and clinical leads, those service leads, those operations and, and BI. We, all need, we also need finance as well because it has to be have some affordability. We also need HROD and workforce intelligence. And you also need staff representation and staff side. There's no, no point in coming up with a great plan that involves doing this to A, to deliver B, if the staff side are not in, involved. And, and it needs governance and monitoring, funding and investment and a transformation and change policy to, to achieve that. Very difficult to read the little organogram type thing to the right, but once you get the slide, you'll be able to zoom in and just see that, that process. Um, next slide, please. So we come, we come to um, a favorite slide of mine and um, the six steps of workforce planning. 
um it it, it it was born probably back in 2002 and three um it started started with the workforce development confederations then moved to the national workforce projects and then obviously to skills for health um but it's still used today and it's still very relevant and still a great thing because it's a framework of six things that you can you can look at around how do, how do i have a workforce plan for my service my team my organization my system and it follows the six steps of defining the plan what you're going to include not include about mapping the service changes that that need to be in there working with commissioners define the required workforce we've got a list of 13 psycho psychological professions and three new ones what do we need where do we need them what and what competency and skill base do they, they know then understanding what we've got where is this workforce? Where is it available? What is coming through our current and, and current training pipelines or education pipelines and what's going to come out in, in the future? Develop that action plan at all levels, I from, from very senior right through, um, and all the levers that you've got. And we've talked around some of those levers within the roles and responsibilities, but in, in how do you do you plan? Pull together the plan. And I, I suppose that the biggest thing is implementing it. It's great to have a plan. It can sit there and go, we've got a plan. But unless you implement it, monitor and revise it as you go along, um, there's no point. So you need to do that stage. Um, and again, there's lots of um, training on workforce planning on the eLearning for Health platform. I've put the link in, in there and HEE. I've just given the integrated care boards and systems some money to do some workforce planning training so um gita i can connect you with where that that money's going in in the systems and he are looking at, at, at running a, a variety of courses so again if it's something that interests you we can connect you and get you involved next slide please oh there's a lot on that slide and i, I will let you read that one one at leisure but again it's to help how do i understand the supplier that i've got yeah and and there's a whole raft of things that you can do or you can get subject matter experts in your organization or in the system to help you with and understand around modeling and scenario planning workforce information and data supply and demand and and the variation education and placements you know where are our placements what numbers what hours are they doing what supervision models are there who's been recruited and how does the selection process work what's the career pathways and progression we know we know that we're working on some integrated career pathways for that for the psychological professions and again coming back looking after the health and well-being of um the the current workforce and the future workforce as, as they join so next slide please um I, I mentioned earlier around the importance of talent management and and, and training needs analysis so there's a bit of a, a, a flow here um I, there's there's been an, an emerging aspiration of the nhs to adopt a more systematic and coordinated approach to managing its talent in light of the current economic and social context in which we we now operate and the, there's a flow chart chart there because actually we need talent to to lead and develop services pathways and organizations now and and in in the future and when everything is critical and relentless as it currently is we sometimes forget around the importance of developing that that talent for for the future and we can end up where we've got serious gaps at heads of um of of, of delivery or senior management uh, because we haven't developed that talent so again there's lots of offers from the northwest leadership academy lots of support from from the people directorate talent leads leadership leads and 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 if you want to get engaged and involved we can connect you next slide please and then we come to workforce transformation and hopefully some of you've heard that um he quite a few years ago developed um, the star tool and it, in its primary function is is as, a, as an organizational development tool to support workforce transformation through purposeful and productive conversations 
with provider systems and you are all a provider and a provider system. Um, linked to that tool, we have a roles explorer. You will need a login. It's on NHS Futures platform or future NHS platform. Um, and there's a collection of resources to support the planning and delivering of workforce redesign to introduce new roles or in innovate, innovative adaptations to existing roles that can be deployed within a service or system. We also have a multidisciplinary tool toolkit, which has looked at all the evidence and research and all the best practice to bring that into one place. Um, we've also got skills for care, the principles of workforce redesign, and obviously the local government association around supporting integration through new roles and working across boundaries report, which the, the psychological professions do. So there's a range of, of workforce transformation initiatives to support you. There is basic level one training on the HE STAR tool. If you think I cannot solve my workforce problem in my service, in my organization, could I use the HE STAR tool to do that? And yes, you can. And there's, there's a, a 30 minute video that just gives you the basic. And then if the demand is there for, for the, the level two training, which is generally one and a half, two days to do a lot more in depth, we can, we can organize that for you. Next slide, please. So how does it work? Um, we will look at the model of community practice um, to support um, workforce planning. And we've done some of that um, with the Psychological Professions Network in the past. And I'm, I'm sure we can, we can bring that in. We need to look at distributed leadership and we need to look at knowledge sharing and, and development. And again, as a, as a network, you've all got great expertise and experience to bring from wider developments into the, the planning process. And that's why it's important. And that's why it's important for the contribution you can make. Uh, next slide, please. How can you get involved? Um, are these my slides? <laughs> I'm just curious now. Um, you can join your regional psychological professions network. Um, you can offer support to your regional psychological professional network and tech news as well. I think I think I've jumped onto a, the end slide. I do apologise, um, but that that I think concludes my presentation. Now, is there any more slides, please? All right, thank you. Thanks, Mike. So yes, I think the end slides were just a quick reminder of, of how to get involved with the PPN, but we'll remind everyone else again at the end. Um, I think that was that was really helpful. And I think there's a couple of comments in terms of can we sort of engage with the, the links for the um, for the HE systems and that kind of thing. So I think firstly, thank you to everyone was just sharing such a wide range of inputs and outputs from the Psychological Professions Network. We have got some questions coming in. Um, I'll probably run through them. I think the first one I'll probably answer because it's just quicker, which is, does the Psychological Professions Network have communities of practice for the different professions? And it does to a degree, but it very much seeks to support and enable whether there are other communities of practice or other professional bodies who are active and support areas which benefit from perhaps a little bit more support and development to begin with. So Liz, I don't know if you wanted to, to add to that one. Yeah, so I guess it's always been very responsive to the members' needs. And when the Northwest PPN set up, there was a very active PWP community that was seeking a home, and the PPN were really supportive in kickstarting that. But it has then very much been led by the group themselves. And we did something similar with the counselling workforce, and um, a counselling community of practice set up quite quickly in the Northwest as well it hasn't gone out across every single professional group because they haven't necessarily felt the same need for a community practice and representation in the same way because all the systems and setups and networks already exist. But as Gita said, we link in with those and we join them together in different ways rather than replicating or duplicating work that doesn't need to happen. So it's very much about responding to the needs of the people and the groups really. 
Thanks, Liz. And so this is, I'll probably just jump to this one because it kind of follows on from that, which is how would you aim to measure the success of the psychological wellbeing practitioner communities of practice? I guess oh, that's a really difficult question. Um, for me, it's always about it being needed. And while people still want to come to the meetings and engage in the work and see outputs, there's still a value to it. And that in itself is a success. I think the influence you can see from the work that we've done in the first 10 years of that community of practice is huge. Um, developing the code of conduct was such a huge step because the PWP workforce just didn't have one. And even though it wasn't you know, legally binding or attached to a professional body, it gave services and individual PWPs something that they've not had before. And for me, that's a real demonstration of the success of what the, the community of practice can do. I think in more recent years, it's possibly flagged a little bit in part because it has been going for a long time. And, you know, that's why we are now looking to have that refresh to see, does it still need to happen? What might that look like? How that might be different for the wider psychological practitioner roles, not just PWPs explicitly. Um, and I think the success of that again comes from people's willingness to be involved in it and get involved in the work. If the workforce don't need it, then we're not going to, put things on that aren't required because they're getting that support from elsewhere. But I think the success in large part comes from the attendance and engagement of the workforce. Thanks, Liz. So, so, so I think the next couple of questions are probably more for Sam, but I'll see if anyone else wants to chip in as well. So I think the first one is, is there guidance around the expectations for supervision for psychological professionals? Um, Yes. <laughs> so there, there, there is, there, there is some guidance. There are some, um, uh, yeah, some uh, documents around um, what uh, supervision uh, is required for different professions at different times. So during training and then after training, um, uh, it's generally not all in one place. Um, so that's what we tried to do with our um, table of supervision requirements, um, which detailed um, not only uh, hours of supervision pre and post training um, that were required, but also who can supervise um, and what qualifications uh, they need. Um, and it all um, links to the, the different curricula um, that has more details there as well. Um, but yeah, as the, there are there are a lot of different psychological professionals um, with uh, yeah different needs for supervision, um, so it does vary. So, so the simple answer is yes, but once you delve into the detail, you've got to do a lot of data collection by the science of it to actually find it all. So, yeah, which, yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. So the thing, next question, which is actually says, Sam, did the research find a difference in the quality of supervision between the larger capacity supervisors versus small capacity? So we, it was a, it was a rapid review. So we didn't have time to go into as much detail as it would have been nice to. Um, so we didn't explicitly look at the quality of supervision. Um, but we did, um, it, it did come up and a lot of people uh, did share that. Um, so it, um, again, it was something that varied. Um, it's different having five supervisees in a group than it is um, doing one-to-one -one supervision um, with five supervisees in terms of um, quality and in terms of demand on your time. And there's a um, there's a there's a balance um, between those things, and then peer supervision as well. Um, there um, there were some supervisors that said that it was easier um, uh, to provide high quality supervision when the supervisees were all in their team, um, and they found it more difficult when there was sort of an increased distance between them and the supervisee. Um, but we um, we didn't explicitly look at um, whether people um, with more supervisees were pro providing a different um, quality of supervision. 
It's an interesting question, but I think, as you said, it, it would probably take quite a lot of, um, of delving into. So I don't know if anyone else wants to, to add to that or make any comments around that. No. So the next one is how can experts by experience get involved in the Psychological Professions Network? So I think this is probably one for, for you to kick off, Joe, if that's OK. Lovely. Thanks, Geeta. Um, yes, I started off uh, in 2012 uh, having retired always been interested in mental health and and, uh, um, and how and, and having had various experiences um, uh, connecting with professionals to try and unpick my own mental health issues uh, basically I mean during the 1980s 1990s I'm actually in a very good space now uh, but it was very interesting to try work work out what worked and what didn't work and why it worked and why it didn't work and, and so being in, in a safer space those uh, I could back and reflect on that and give back something to uh, people who had been uh, so wise and welcoming to me. Um, so that began in 2012. I uh, discovered uh, an organisation based in Manchester, Anxiety UK, um, which works with people with anxiety and depression. And I started to work with them, uh, doing some mentoring uh, with people who had uh, mild uh, anxiety and depression on the gap seven scale um, as a result of that I then found some work with the clinical psychology department at the University of Manchester and so I said in the video it was a case of you start small and suddenly the pool gets wider and you file in uh, larger and wider networks so I'm now part of the PPA West I'm also part of the group of trainers in clinical psychology. It's just one of those things of that virtuous circle of uh, through conversation and through uh, weeks like this, uh, netting, uh, to use that awful phrase, and you know, sort of uh, getting more involved with your conversation and being really part of the conversation. I think. The worry sometimes is, oh, is this an exercise? And I really, really believe it is not. Um, I'm involved in the tr three-year training of clinical psychologists at the University of Manchester, and I love that. And it's working with the trainees that's the most powerful and impactful part of it. And generally, when I talk to other EBEs, people will say that what is most value is the notion of being able to tell my story. What didn't work? What was that journey like? Where were the barriers? Where were the enablers? And all of that comes through in those ongoing conversations. And I think that's what's usually important and validating. That I think is the key thing to um, what I get out of, I hope, I give to uh, trainees in return. Thanks, Joe. And I think, I mean, overall, the other question that was asked is, if you're not a psychological professional, can you join the PPN? And the answer is very much yes. I mean, on the website, there's a lot of information about how you can register. It doesn't cost anything. And then there's an opportunity to have a look around, see, what, see what's going on. And there are different things. There are similar things, but there are also different things going on in all the different um, regional psychological professions network. So as Joe's described, there's a lot going on in the Northwest, certainly, and a lot of the clinical psychology training courses have experts by experience involvement but I think we're also at different stages of developing our kind of co-production work and our you know our joint working between experts by experience across all the psychological professions networks and also that the overarching sort of psychological professions network England but you know please do join if you have an interest in this area because we'd certainly like to hear your voice and anything that can kind of um, contribute to how the psychological professions can actually help you and the wider world is, is something that's really, really important. So we've now got a slightly different um, question, um, which I'll, I think we'll probably all have something to say about this one. So how would up-to-date technology help in the future or is it a hindrance to all ways of working? So I don't know if anyone's got, wants to, 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 to start off with that one in terms of what they, they think, or shall I just, just, um, suggest someone go on Liz 
I'll, I'll start with sharing a view. Um, for me, and I've always been based very much in the improving access to psychological therapies aspects of psychological professions, technology helps us to improve access by giving different ways in. You know, for a lot of years in services, we tried to do things a bit differently and use technology, and there was always kind of some fear and barriers as to how to best do that. And for me, one of the silver linings that has come out of the craziness of the last two years with COVID is that suddenly we went, oh, we really do need to use technology and do things differently. And it's shown how much we can do. But for me, what's really important goes back to what Mike was saying about this should always be about the people that we're working with and for, that that technology should be about making sure that they get the best experience, not about cutting costs or working differently to be more efficient, but to increase the different ways that we can work to give a really good experience to everybody who wants to access services in all of those different ways. So yes, I know, know more about what that might be like within IAP settings, but I think there's lots of opportunities across all the psychological professions to think about how we use those technologies to give a better experience to the people that we're working with and for. And some of that comes back to the importance of us genuinely engaging in co-production with experts by experience to understand how those technologies might be most useful for us. Thanks, Liz. Comments from others? Joe? Yeah, yeah could I just say, uh, 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 I absolutely agree with Liz that you know, sort of being able to talk with people in the Northwest via Zoom or Teams is absolutely brilliant. A service user perspective, I have a little caveat insofar as that, um, you know, sort of if I'm having that consultation or that discussion with a therapist in my room, um, then the problems I have are still in the space that I'm living in. And if I'm in a, uh, a crowded space, don't feel I've got the confidentiality of being able to talk, you know, sort of talk problems, that's the problem. And when the um, the session finishes, still with myself in my own space in my bedroom, with those problems I've you know sort of tried to unpick with my therapist. Sometimes going away to an even third place, you know, sort of somewhere else, can be helpful. Uh, and also, I think from the point of view of the therapist, uh, perhaps he or she wants to see all of me. My doing with my hands while I'm you know, facing the screen, you know. Are there other verbal clues that you're able to pick up as a therapist because I'm just a you know a head and shoulders on the screen? So those would be possible caveats, but at the same time, the uh, you know there is an accessibility as well that goes along with that. And if I'm struggling to pay a fare into town to go to a, then I don't have to do that if I'm sat in my bedroom. So yeah, the swing roundabouts. Yeah, I, I, I'd agree with that. And I think that there is very much something about, you know, up to that date technology for all of us, if it was universal, would be great. But I think sometimes there's challenges with, with technology. And certainly, you know, it's if you're halfway through a session with someone and your IT goes down at whichever end, it's making sure we've got contingency plans for those things as well. So I don't know if, if others want to contribute I mean, it's not purely about clinical. Mike? <clears throat> yeah, just um, I, I agree with what Liz and um, Joe have said. Um, and I think the te technology has to be applicable and appropriate um, for, 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 the, for the person or patient who, who needs that. But actually, the, the advances and the case studies and the evidence that we're beginning to see through um, remote monitoring, um, wearables, um, environments, um, artificial intelligence, um, digital and and robotics um, is, is really showing it can make a difference. Um, we've got to ensure there's not digital, they've got, we've got to ensure there's digital, digital inclusion and not exclusion, but actually the evidence does show when it's applicable and appropriate, it can improve the experience, it can improve the access and we, and we, and we need to be cognizant of of that and fortuitously on friday we're we're doing a northwest input into the 
NHS England National Digital Strategy. So we've got a workshop on Friday and a workshop in December to really galvanise some of this thinking. So what we're saying today, I'm going to take this with me around around some of the barriers and some of the, the, the caveats, but actually the positives of this as well. Thanks. Sam, from your perspective, what do you think? Yeah, yeah. So um, speaking in terms of supervision, um, it is it can be really useful. So here in the southwest, we've got you know a few large population centres, um, but then huge patches of rurality as well. Um, and a lot of the time, it takes a long time to travel between them. Um, you've got loads of tiny little country roads um, going from you know, uh, Truro in Cornwall up to um, North Devon uh, can take a really long time. So being able to um, cut that travel time um, and talk to someone remotely uh, can really help with sharing that supervisor capacity across the region um, so that you can, um, yeah, have, have that resource shared um, across services in a way that you couldn't if you had to physically travel everywhere. Thanks. So I guess in terms of for the person who asked that question, in terms of how would up to date technology help in the future or is it a hindrance to all ways of working? I think the general consensus is it's not a hindrance, but I think we've got to be smart about how we use it. And I think in terms of we don't all have equal access to all technology and how do we make sure that we don't exclude people who can't use it or won't use it and how we actually make our, ourselves available to offer psychological working you know across the board using technology as we can make it happen and i think you know liz is right in terms of lockdown we suddenly moved very very quickly and it's probably had a benefit in terms of the amount of travel and um, emissions and exhaust fumes and all the rest of it. There is a trade off in terms of even computers make noise, heat, light and all the rest of it. But there may be benefits. So I think we haven't got many more questions, but there was um, a comment about um, being interested in the link for Health Education England to have a look at in terms of the workforce planning. Mike, could you just remind us briefly about what, what's available and where we can go for that? So um, on, on the NHSE Learning for Health platform, there's a, there's a range of workforce planning courses from, from very beginner um, to un, just understanding the, the process and the concepts to, to quite um, expert and a whole range of competency skill programs that, that, that people can engage with and, and, and interact. Um, if the network would like um, a webinar around introductions to, to workforce planning or any element, we, we can organize that. We have got expert workforce planners within within the, the Northwest. They, they are very experienced at, at putting webinars together to, to share the, the skills. And, and they've done a variety of face-to-face of, of -face sessions. And I, I suppose, on, on the horizon, which which I did forget to mention in, in the slides, is that at some point, um, once we get through the, the autumn statement tomorrow, HE will launch the 15-year framework, which is a 15-year view um, of, of what society and workforce and people will look like over, over the next 15 years. Um, again a lot of evidence and a lot of research has gone into it and and listening to a lot of of people and experts around that on the back of that nhs england will publish its long-term plan and a refresh of the long-term workforce plan to help deliver the 15-year framework but in the meantime whilst we're waiting for that um, providers will be asked to do their operating plans and it could be a one-year or five-year plan but um, ICBs and IC systems have got to write a five-year workforce strategy. So again, it, it may be worth just understanding how the planning process works to ensure that we get the psychological profession network voice in the five-year strategies for each of the, the systems. Wherever you live, um, whatever place you live, you are part of an integrated care board 
and an integrated care system that delivers health and care for you and your 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 neighborhood and population so it's essential to get that voice heard whether it's in the mental health long-term plan which covers the psychological professions or the 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 general um five-year workforce plan so you, you've got that that view at both ends of of the scale so um if anybody wants to contact me i can share further links further evidence further research if 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 workforce planning is something that you, you're really interested in and, and want to take forward I think we're pretty much, excuse me, <coughs> at the end of most of the questions. And just for our last couple of minutes, I just wanted to give all our speakers the opportunity just to say another couple of words to add to what we've we've been talking about today, which is, you know, um, what can the PPN do for you and what can you do for the PPN? So in, I'll just start at the beginning. So, Liz. Well, I think I probably said this at the start, but for me, the multi-professional nature of the network has really changed things for the psychological professions and the conversations that we have and that for me has been one of the most valuable things of being part of the ppn both the links and the networks and the relationships that i've got out of that but also i think the better understanding across the board that we've got of each other's roles and ways of working and and the opportunities and the the nice fortuitous serendipity things that have come out of the network just by having those conversations and making those links part of that being part of he as well and making those links across to different networks and you know the work that we've done with my crown workforce planning and there was one year i think workforce plans were brought to the network and we commented on them and it felt like a really valuable piece of work it it sounds cliched but the network bit of the network the networking that goes with it just you just can't underestimate the the richness that comes with that and and we've adapted ourselves through doing a lot more things online and less in person and i miss being in person sometimes but i think in other ways that's further supported our engagement to do things in different ways particularly as other regions have grown ppns and how we can work together across the country as well with those regions so yeah for me it's the networking in the network that you just can't you just can't underestimate the value of. Thanks, Liz. Sam? Yeah, I would definitely agree with Liz. Um, and I think the work that all the different PPNs do is so varied across all the different regions. Um, and there's so many different things that we do um, that, you know, if you're sat at home and you're thinking, what, well, I really want to do this, um how can the ppn help me it's worth getting in touch um and talking it through because we might already be working in that space or we might really want to um and want to support you to do those things um and it is it is just that that variety working across such a broad range of professions um that is what i think makes it really special thanks sam joe yeah, it's about you know, sort of starting off uh, with trainees at the U of Manchester and then being able to see what, what what's happening, what's happening in Lancaster, what's happening at UCLan. Is there any ideas of better practice that I could, you know, sort of take from those, those conversations and bring back to the University of Manchester? So it's and entering that kind of like experience as an EBE with other EBEs. So that you part of the, if you like broadening that conversation out and uh, uh, bringing you know, ideas back to back to where I'm working you know sort of from the places so that to me is a huge important so thank you Mike um, I, I agree with what um, everybody said and and um, just to, to reflect the, the network is is uh, a coming together and bringing together of a, a fantastic range of of psychological professions and non psychological professions um, to to bring that subject matter expertise that best practice that sharing and that learning across the the the, the, the different roles and um, we do need to plan effectively for the psychological professions in in services in pathways and and in organizations so i think work working together 
in synergy will will really support um, the, the the planning. And I, I touched briefly on sort of population health and and demand. And I mentioned that I was reading an article earlier, and the National Office for S- Statistics quite difficult to say. Um, today have just published that um, there's over 600,000 people who have left work for mental health, illness, anxiety, depression over over a, a period of, of time. And actually the demand for the services that, that you provide um, in organisations is just going to carry on in increasing and we need to plan effectively how we how we deliver that now and in the future and have a pipeline of of workforce coming through so this network is essential the work they do is essential and the contribution to um, population health and looking after people is also essential thanks mike so if we could just go to the final slide um, just to remind people how you can get involved which is join your regional PPN. The website link is there, but you'll probably know where it is because you read, use that link to register for the conference as well. Look at how you can get involved and tell people about us. I think I have nothing to add to what our fantastic speakers have already said other than that I feel so privileged to be part of um, a very welcoming, innovative thinking and enthusiastic network and how we can actually improve the benefits for psychological work for everyone. So thank you very much and hope you've enjoyed today. Please do um, fill in the feedback form and I think that'll be coming up through the Slido and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.